to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Here they are, your Weekend Warriors, Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We've got another great show lined up for you. If you haven't checked our show out before, Tony and I have been working for the Par Lumber Company for, I don't know. Um, I'm, let's just say so many years. 15 years, 25 years, 30, you're like 30 years? Way up there, yeah. 35, 40, 50? No, 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 no. <laughs> 80 years? I'm in my 40s now, so it definitely was, uh, yeah. You've been there a long time. Start, yeah, I started when I was 16. I was in high school, actually, when I started. So you have a lot of experience with Par Lumber. I've got 15 years of experience with Par Lumber. And we come to you every week, and we talk about all kinds of stuff. Today is no exception. We have so many topics on the radar today. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to squeeze it all in. It's a lot, really. We're going to kind of uh, be bouncing all over the place. But there's a lot of really good information that we want to share and uh, sort of just, this is like a glimpse into our minds, kind of, you know. We sat down to put together the show, and we talked about so many different things that are pertinent right now for us in the industry. And we thought, you know, we should share all of these thoughts with our listeners. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be very squirrely today. <laughs> we are going to squirrel around a lot. Yeah, so I think we're going to talk a little bit about curb appeal. We haven't talked about curb appeal on the show in a long time. Right. It's one of those things that everybody should think about. You know, the, the front of your house, what it looks like from the curb as people are walking by. It's the first impressions that your house makes is the most important. Yeah. And if it looks shabby, people are going to think the house is shabby, especially <laughs> if you're selling it. Yeah. One of the one of the first things you see, for example, when you pull up to a house, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, is the mailbox. What does the mailbox look like? Is it uh, is it falling over? Is it leaning on the next door neighbor's mailbox? Uh, is it rusty? Does the door work? You know, can you read your your house numbers on the side of the mailbox? Is your post office worker yelling at you? or dislike you because you have the nastiest mailbox in town. That's just one example. You pull up to a place with a mailbox that's in disrepair, and you're thinking, wow, this is terrible. I yep. wonder if the inside of the house looks like the inside of the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's an extreme, that's right? That's a stretch. But here's the thing. When somebody's coming to look at your house, like if you're selling it, they stack all these things up. If the first thing they see is a shabby mailbox, and then they walk up and they see, you know, torn up driveway and the grass is not mowed and there's weeds growing all over and cobwebs hanging from your eaves and the front door is two colors or needs to be painted. Uh, all They just stack all those things. And every time they see another thing that they don't like about your home, your opportunity to sell for the price that you want to sell for goes down. Yeah, The percentage of possibility drops with everything. So everything you can make look nice from the curb is helping you get that potential buyer one step closer to the inside of your house. I totally agree with that because when I was house hunting, we would go look at houses and they would look really good in the pictures. You know, real estate agents have a talent for making pictures look, you know, amazing. That mm -hmm. house looked really, really good. And then you pull up out front, you get out of the car in one look at the house. I was like, nope. Yep. <laughs> I'm not I'm not even going inside. Yeah. That house looks like a dump. Yeah. And we would leave. That house Sometimes looks we would like. would go in and I was right. The outside of that house looks like it stinks on the inside. <laughs> I'm not going in. <laughs> I mean, you know, people are going to draw their own opinions. And those opinions are going to be based on the little bit of information that they have. And the tiniest bit of information that they have is what they see from the curb. That's right. So if you can affect that and make that part the best stuff, then you're better chance of getting them to come in and take a look. Yes, sir. So uh, with some of the other things we're going to talk about on the show today, we're going to give you like a little market update of what the housing market's looking like. Yeah. Uh, we're going to give you, I've got a few stories I want to tell. <laughs> we used to do a, a segment on this show years and years ago called Pain in the House. Pain in the House. And uh, we would share terrible stories of somebody's misfortune yeah. around their home. We so actually I've hear compiled them, a few. We actually hear them a lot uh, because we work for Par Lumber Company and uh, contractors and homeowners alike come in and they tell us stories 
as they're purchasing materials that they need to fix these types of things. And uh, they're always good. It's always good to share. Totally. I love that. Yeah. And the other thing, the last thing we're going to talk about is uh, quality control. We're going to talk about some different products mm -hmm. uh, that will offer you better quality than maybe what you're, you've been using. Yeah. We talk about this a lot, right? These two things are exactly the same. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They're the same, right? Well, no. Right. I mean, there's something about them that makes them different. Certainly, there have they have high points and low points. The same thing goes with um, with different brands of composite decking, like Trex and TimberTech. Uh, they're just because they are both in the same category of product does not mean that they're made equally. Uh, so it's important to n understand what the nuances are about the, a certain product because some of them will work better in certain situations and others of them will work better in other situations. And so choosing the right quality of material for your job is important. Yeah. And uh, proper quality control also with the installation also is very important. We talked about, just as we were introing this segment, Corey, we were talking about curb appeal being important in the way that people may be shopping to purchase your home. Well, here's another little angle for that. Another reason why it's important to make your home look appealing from the curb. You can make an impression on the other homes in your neighborhood. You know this is true. I know this is true. Absolutely. You could be the guy or gal that has the shabbiest home in the neighborhood, or you could be the guy or the gal that has the sharpest home in the neighborhood. Either way, everybody, everybody's property sets a precedent for the neighbors. If your next door neighbor goes out on Saturday morning and mows his lawn, you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I should mow my lawn. Tell me that's not true. No, you're, that is true. That's absolutely true. If everybody's lawns in the neighborhood are freshly mowed and nice and clean and weeded, uh, a majority of the people, when they move in, they, they keep it up. You can make those impressions on your neighbors. If your neighbor is not doing a great job of keeping his home looking nice and fresh and clean, maybe you're not setting a good enough example. I'm not saying it's on you as a homeowner to set the bar in your neighborhood, but you could. You could potentially. So it's as important as wanting your house to look as great as it can because maybe it's going up for sale, but it's just as important to keep your house looking as great as you can to set the precedent for your neighbors. And you could lift up the entire neighborhood because of your hard work. And so I feel like that is, I feel like that is a valid reason to work hard, keeping your home look as nice as, as it should. Curb appeal. Curb appeal. Absolutely. When we come back after this break, we are going to talk a little bit about market trends, what's going on in the market, how it's affecting buying and selling of homes as we understand it, right? We're not uh, real estate agents or experts in that field, but, but it is important. It affects what we do and how we live every day, especially as homeowners. So we'll just talk a little bit about that when, when we come back from the break, give you a better understanding of what's going on in the market, and then some more about curb appeal shortly after that. You're listening to Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. Thanks for staying with us. If you haven't already, go check out our YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram pages. We're at WW Home Show. Uh, we're recording this show right now. We're up on YouTube. And uh, go check that out. Hit subscribe. Hit like. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you can leave them either on our YouTube page or you can email us. You can email us at W. Nope, sorry, Weekend Warriors at par.com. Right, Weekend Warriors at par.com. And if that's too difficult, go to par.com. That's P A R R.com. Click on the Weekend Warriors link. That takes you to our website. And uh, you can I'll find all of our information on there. So, absolutely. Make sure you do that. So, Tony, today we're talking about curb appeal. Uh, but we did want to take some time out to talk about the current market. Yeah. I mean, I have my thoughts on it, you have yours. Uh, I know you've had a little bit of experience. You've done a little bit of research and some reading on what's going on nationwide, kind of what's going on here. What are you seeing, Tony? 
Well, from my perspective as the, the manager of Par Lumber Company, and I, I get to see the sales and I get to hear how other yards are doing and how our competition is doing. I mean, really, honestly, 2019 has been pretty well flat with 2018 as far as material sales and that sort of thing. There's a few things that play in there. The price of lumber is down a little bit this year compared to last year. And so even even with uh, flat numbers that, you know, that sales are up just a little bit. But um, as far as single family home sales, permits for single family homes, which is really kind of what we're dealing with, less apartments and multifamily, um, it's really all pretty flat uh, compared to last year. There is uh, some conversation there about um, maybe seeing it softening up a little bit more, um, maybe towards the end of this year or going into 2020, but that's not bad. You know, um, a market correction in our situation is not bad. We have a situation where the homes that are priced up above a half a million, you know, above $500,000, six or seven or whatever, those seem to be not selling as much. Um, so because they're not selling, there's a more of a surplus of inventory there and homes that we, people want to be buying, which are below that price. Um, there's a really short inventory there, so they're not out there. And, uh, and it's, that's, what's keeping it going. Of course, um, interest rates are still low. And so that's not really playing into it very much. Um, but you had some interesting information about property and how property, uh, something about property that is sort of inhibiting the, the uh, new construction process. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the biggest hot button you hear right now is affordable housing. You know, affordable housing, to me, is probably different than it is to you, is different than it is to somebody from Southern California. Affordable housing is the problem, right? So you have these people who are trying to get first-time home buyers. Maybe they've been renting. Now they're in their late 20s, maybe early 30s, and they want to buy a home. What does that mean? What's an affordable house? $99,000. Yeah, you know. <laughs> That's super affordable. I mean, right now, affordable means three to 400,000, somewhere in that range, maybe even mid fours. That's affordable. And to get that, you're looking at, you know, single family attached housing or like a row house or a townhome, uh, even condos or apartments that you can buy. Um, you'll see a lot of those buildings going up in downtown, downtown Portland. Um, but the, the multifamily living, I don't think is sustainable. You know, I've heard of a lot of people from like the millennials, you know, that, that younger group that's in their say early thirties right now are getting married. They're having kids and they want property. They want grass. They don't want to live in an apartment downtown. There's, there's no, uh, great schools within their reach. So they're moving out to the suburbs or the exurbs is another term I heard. <laughs> Uh, you know, these these suburbs are doing really, really well. Uh, but the problem is, is that property values or proper, yeah, property in its own is very expensive still, and it's rising. So to get a chunk of property, divide it out, develop it, and build affordable housing is very, very difficult. So what I'm seeing is a lot of uh, growth being pushed out beyond the normal suburbs that we're used to, areas where you wouldn't think to yourself, Holy cow, who's living there? I super, mean, that is, super rural areas. Yeah, super rural, but they're getting developed quickly. You know, there's big builders that are going into these areas, buying acres and acres, subdeveloping them, and slamming, you know, 500 houses, 600 houses, 1,000 houses in. I mean, there's some developments around my house where they're putting six, 7,000 houses in these planned communities that are hopefully going to be in that price range. But I feel like everything that I see that's being built now and, and put out for sale is not in that price range. It's up above. Yeah. And I think that that's really uh, probably what's, uh, what's kept the inventory of the lower valued homes, right? Um, so low because there's so many people clamoring for that and, uh, and they're just not out there because it costs so much to build. Yeah, I think you're seeing that. You I mean the the four to five to six hundred range? You know, that's the second home, right? That's somebody that has bought their home ten years ago. Maybe they bought it before the Great Recession. 
you know, of 2008 mm-hmm. and they've made all their money back on it. And they've, they have a nice piece of equity there and they've sold it. And now they can jump into those five or $600,000 homes. That's kind of what I'm seeing. The 700 plus, the 800 plus, those are definitely slowing down. I the feel custom like, home. I feel like that, uh, I, I mean, I, I read this uh, also in an article, but I feel like that the builder confidence is up. B- the, the builders aren't out there worried about building a home and not being able to get their money back out of it or not being able to sell it or having to sit on it. You know, that's been a, a problem in the past, but builder confidence is up and that's not a problem. I think it just is the amount of money that you have to spend to develop the property and build the house ultimately lands it in an area that's up out of the range where the majority of the people buying are buying. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. But, you know, it depends on the builder, right? So if there's a builder that does infill, and what I mean by that is, you know, for instance, there's a, there was a, a lot of builders several years ago who would go into downtown, they'd find these dilapidated homes on a big chunk of property, like say 10,000 square foot, which doesn't seem that big, but it is big these days. Uh, and they would, tear down a house, subdivide it and put up two. And that's called infill, you know, or they or they would find these bigger lots and infill these these houses in there. That has gone away. I mean, I don't I know a majority of the builders that were doing that are just getting completely out of it because the prices of the land to buy that house, to demo it, to get the plans, to get the permits, they're into that dirt for way more than they would need to be to to, to create or build an affordable home. Right. You know, so that infill stuff is totally slowed down for now. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens here in the next year, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see a slight correction. Well, there's definitely, my opinion. there's definitely some talk about slowing in 2020 compared to 2019. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? Uh, keeps us in check. Uh, not something like we saw in 2008 at all. Um, but just a softening and a slowing down in 2020, uh, some sort of a, a correction. But that's not taking place right now. Uh, if that does, I think we would see us transitioning into a buyer's market out of a seller's market, which is where we're at right now. And uh, that's always a good thing, too. That helps, uh, that helps everybody out. So, um, so, you know, we're looking forward to see, seeing what does take place. But uh, where we're at right now in 2019, we're strong like we were last year. And uh, everything is going along super smooth. And um, home values uh, are continue to rise. Home values are not down. Home values are up. That's good. And so moving, moving into 2020, I think we're in a good situation. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, okay, so that's sort of the market, the way Corey and I see it. You know, it's our, it's our uh, experience in the communication that we have with professionals that are in the industry. And, uh, and that's just, just us sharing with you how we see it. And uh, if somebody were to come up to me on the street and ask me, that's exactly what I would say. As a 30-year you know, employee in this, in this industry, I think As somebody who I sells building materials, Tony says, yeah, you should build it. Yeah. <laughs> All Warriors. right, we've got to take another quick break. When we come back, more curb appeal. You're listening to Tony for your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Hey everybody, here's a quick tip for you when you're using extension cords. If you have to plug in one of your tools, uh, a good thing to do is to tie the ends around like that and plug them in. So that way, if you're working with your tool and you get to the end of your extension cord, it just doesn't unplug or if it gets caught on something. So that'll help you uh, stay more productive. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Tony and I today are talking about curb appeal and how important it is because it's the first impression. People roll up to your house and it's the first thing they think. They look at it. It's like shaking somebody's hand and, you know, making a terrible joke. You know, it's a first impression. (laughs) Yeah, right. They see your house and they go, man, that's a nice house. Yeah. Must be really nice people. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes they see have you ever appealed a curb appealed yeah some, like a banana so yeah sometimes you see the curb and it's got so much moss on it you need to appeal it all off <laughs> that's a bad joke <laughs> fortunately this is not your first impression <laughs> I, 
Yes. Hopefully. Curb appeal is the uh, is the impression that you take away from a home when you view it from the street side or from the curb side. And there's a lot of reasons um, why that's important for you to keep up. Here's one, for example, we've already mentioned a couple earlier on the show. Here's another one, for example. Uh, if you let something go that needs to be repaired, something that's in disrepair, and you let it go for six months, Corey, is it in the same condition six months later as it was when you first noticed it was in disrepair? No. It is not. You see, it is the problem stacks. When you have a problem and you let that problem sit, that problem probably is going to become two problems or at the very least one much bigger problem. You can't see a problem and ignore it and expect that the repair is going to be exactly the same six months down the road as it was now. Right. The earlier you address the issue, the less money it will cost you, the shorter period of time it will take you to fix it, and the better off you will be. So it stands to reason that if if you're seeing problems on your property from the street view, if you are not staying on top of it and, and taking care of it right away, it's going to cost you more money and more time down the road the longer you wait. So it stands to reason, keep the house looking nice and keep the repairs up to date regularly and it will be a money saver and a time saver for you. Yeah. And a headache saver. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with that because, you know, it's like the glass, what do I say, the glass, broken glass thing where if you have a, a neighborhood and there's one broken out glass, it just spreads like a virus. People you know, are like, get this, oh, you get that, yeah, yeah, you know, and then you get crime. I actually read a, a, a an interesting study the other day that they by tearing down old, beaten down, abandoned houses in Detroit, close to my hometown, the crime rate fell by a significant number just by getting rid of that element out of the neighborhood. Interesting. So, I mean, you could just think about that as, you know, if you have a beautiful home that you keep up very, very well, it spreads. I what mean, a- when I first moved into my first home, I was the guy on the street that had the nicest lawn. I always strive to have the nicest lawn on my street. It was always green. I always took care of it, weeded it, mowed it, trimmed it. You know, we, we I fixed everything that broke immediately. You were a proud new homeowner. That's right. And I tell you what, the neighbor across the street took notice. The neighbor down the street took notice. The guy next to me took notice. The gal over across on the other way took notice. And they started maintaining their homes a little nicer. Yeah. So, and it just added to everyone's curb appeal that came down that street. So, it's just super important. You said that they started to tear down dilapidated uh, homes. Abandoned. Abandoned yeah. homes. Did they also start to tear down firebombed homes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, quick story. Uh, Here's a quick, interesting story for you. Segue. That you you know this story. I do, of course. But, uh, but it's a great one. So I bought my first home in Flint, Michigan. I grew up in Flint, born and raised. And uh, we moved into a little suburb called Davison. You know, actually, Michael Moore went to my high school. Wow. Yeah. I don't know who Michael Moore is, but that's awesome. Oh, good thing. Uh, anyway, so he went to my high school. But anyway, we, I bought my first home in Flint. Well, it's $12,000. Twelve grand. Nice. In 1998. Wow. And it was a beautiful two-story home. I think it was like 1,800 square feet. Had a two-car garage, a full basement. I mean, it was a nice house. Full hardwood floors. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I bought that home, and the crime was so bad. I mean, there was... There was an instance where somebody got in a fight with a woman and they were beating her up Uh-oh. in my in right in front of my house. Yikes. I called the police. I didn't want to go out there and get involved in it because I knew it was probably gang related. So I didn't even I didn't even want anybody thinking that I wanted anything to do with that, right? And I and I was 18. You know, I wasn't going to get messed up with these people. Sure. So they were fighting and they were beating up this girl and I called the police and then I called the police again and I called the police again and they finally showed up four hours later. Oh my. It's dark out. I walk outside with the phone in my hand. I'm like, hey man, I called you guys. They practically pulled their guns on me. (laughs) And I said, it's just a phone. 
just yeah. I'm the one that called you. And they're like, well, we don't see anything going on here. <laughs> said, well, they didn't want to be there any more than you did. I said, yeah, well, it's four hours ago. Yeah. I said, look, the gal that they beat up lives in that house. And I kind of pointed at the house. And I said, I don't know who the guys were. And it was kind of my neighbor. I didn't never met him. But so they go over and knock on the door. And sure enough, she didn't answer. Her mom did. She said, we don't know what you're talking about. Oh, no. Nothing happened. Yikes. Shortly after that, the very same house, within, I don't know, a month, was firebombed. Yikes. They threw Molotov cocktails through the front window, burned the house completely out, burned out. Did your $12,000 house become worth (laughs) $8,000 immediately after that? So here's the crazy thing about this, right? This was in 1998. I, I moved out immediately and I sold the house. I lost a little bit of money on it, but I sold it for about what I owed on it. But I'm telling this story some co- to some coworkers about a year ago. And they're like, oh, no way. So I said, yeah. So I pull up the old house and tell them about it on Google Street View. Mm-hmm. And then I turn the little camera around to look at the house that was firebombed. Still standing there. Still standing there. Still firebombed. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Uh, this is 20 years later. Yeah. Still sitting there. Yeah. This is a, this is an, a great example, right? Um, you want to make your home look as great as it can in your neighborhood. And you want to encourage through that, you want to encourage your neighbors to do the same thing to their homes. And you can affect the element in your neighborhood in my opinion, you can affect the element in your neighborhood by presenting your home in such a way. So it's super duper important uh, that you that you stay on top of the curb appeal of your home. And there are a lot of ways that you can improve it. Okay, so even if we're not talking about a situation where you have a home that's in disrepair, but instead you uh, you want to improve it to take it up just one more level. There are actually a lot of very inexpensive, easy to do projects that you can uh, that you can undertake in order to improve the value of your home and to improve your curb appeal. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and we should talk about some of those things today. Obviously, maintaining your home is one thing, but taking on projects that are affordable and easy to do, perfect weekend warrior type projects, uh, to keep moving your house forward. Let's let's throw one out there real quick. Super easy one to do is upgrade your front door hardware. Yeah. That is so easy to do. I mean, it's it can be a little bit expensive depending on what door style you have and what you're looking to buy. I mean, a good handle set could potentially run 150 bucks. 150 to 500. I would say for a really, really good one, you're right around 500, four to 500 bucks. But I mean, that small amount of money is change completely changes the entry. Yeah, that is definitely a small project for one day, a little investment and can really change the look. And of course, you won't stop there. There are other things on the front patio or to your front door or your entryway, if you want to call it that, uh, things that you can do to improve the look of your home from the street. And as a matter of fact, the entryway is a key place, and we'll tell you why as soon as we come back from this break. You're listening to Tony Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Tony and Corey here with the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. Hey, Corey. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, have you seen our new YouTube channel? Um, of course I have. Haven't you subscribed to it yet? Uh, yeah, totally. Is that a yes or a no? Well, I don't really know how, so... Look, it's easy. All you have to do is go to www.homeshow.com and click on the YouTube link. Hit subscribe, and you're good to go. Uh, but my arms are too short. Oh, come on, it's not that hard? I think I got bit by a spider. What? Are you okay? No, yeah, I'm fine. Hey, 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 does my head look big to you? No? You don't think so? Well, whatever. Tune in this weekend. You'll definitely get a laugh, and you'll likely get some good advice, but only if you listen. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Today, Tony and I are talking about curb appeal, and uh, we we started out the last segment talking about the entryway. And the entryway 
as Tony put it, is the key way. What'd you say? The key way? Uh, is that where the key goes? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if that's what I said, but uh, I definitely said there that it is. Uh, there's, hmm, it's a key place to start transforming the look of your home from the curb side because oh, sure. and the reason why is because cost versus value report which comes out every year which we share with our listeners every year states re, uh, that replacement or painting of the front door or the entryway uh, is one of the top return on investments that you can do to your home to improve your curb appeal so while you're in the entryway and you're replacing your entry door hardware take a time to evaluate the condition of your front door does your front door need to be replaced or is the door in good shape but it needs to be repainted or restained um, is it time to go from maybe an old wood door to a new fiberglass door is it time to go from a solid door with no glass to maybe a door with a couple of side lights a transom and, and some glass in the front. You know, you can really dress up the front of your house by changing out the entry door. And that is also not something that breaks, breaks the bank. And not only is that an affordable project, I mean, you know, it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars, but it's, but you're going to get your money back in spades. Oh yeah. For a project like that. I agree. And that definitely is a, a really good way to improve the curb appeal of your Well, home. like you said, it's always towards the top of the cost versus value report. The money that you put in, you're getting right out of it. Right. Uh, but if you didn't want to necessarily spend that much money, a couple grand's a lot, but if you just want to really update the look of your home, consider painting it. Painting your entry door would take a weekend. I mean, it's not that difficult. You got to do it, in my opinion, the right way, the right way. You got to take it off the take it off the door, take it off the hinges, take out all the hardware, lay it flat and really take your time to paint that thing. Well, I mean, if you get it done, you try to get it done in one day so you can put the door back on before you go to bed. <laughs> right. That's my opinion. Unless you have a storm door or a security door or something like that. It doesn't matter. Here's um, a place to take note. If you are deciding what paint you're going to use, choosing an oil based paint. Probably not the best way to go. While it is super durable, it takes a long time to dry and cure. Oh, yeah. So an oil-based paint would be a difficult decision to make if you were hoping to get it done in a day. Yeah. You know, and I'm not a professional painter, but I've painted a lot of things in my life. And if I were to give you a tip, it would be to use a paint that does dry a little bit slower, especially on a door like that. Uh, maybe some sort of enamel or slow drying enamel, uh, because if you paint it really quickly with a brush or with a roller or a foam roller, even if you have a fast drying acrylic, then those little marks, your little brush marks and the little roll marks are going to dry in there. In my experience. Yeah. So I always like to use a slower drying enamel in a tip would be that if you're going to have to hang the door back up, Take all the weather stripping out so that way nothing is touching the door and it'll allow that paint to dry uh, over the course of several days. Yeah. Cure. Really. Cure. Yeah. yeah. It'll just be it, it, if you don't let it cure, it'll be super easy to scratch and peel and peel. So, yeah. yeah also, make sure, key. Yeah, make sure you prep the door properly. Uh, if you've got a if you've got a finish on there now, whether it's a stain or a paint, uh, you need to get that off. And you want to make sure that you properly prep the surface. If that means lightly sanding it to get a little scruff on there, open up the pores. Um, I don't know if it's if it's steel. Uh, that's probably not, you know, you're not going to be opening up pores, right? But you're going to scruff that uh, surface so that the paint will have something to adhere to, in my experience. Yeah, paint in any application is only as good as the substrate you're putting it on. So if you're putting paint over, say, peeling paint, your new paint's going to peel off. So if you have an old cracked door with old cracked paint on it, then you'll definitely want to take the time to either put paint remover or scrape it off. So that way there's nothing there that could potentially come off. And if you want it to look really nice, yeah, I would definitely scrape it. Do you, How strongly do you feel about priming a door? Um, maybe 
maybe whether it's wood or metal, maybe you have a different answer, but how do you, how strongly do you feel about priming a door before you put a finished coat of paint on it? Are we talking about a two day thing where you prime it, prep it and prime it one day and then paint it the next? That's potential. I mean, it just depends on your situation, right? But it do, yeah, I mean, honestly, it depends. If you're, if you have bare wood, if you have an old wood door and it's bare, you definitely want to prime it, right? You have to prime it. So, I mean, but primer dries really, really quickly, depending on which one you get. You can get a primer that dries to the touch and is paintable within a half an hour. You were talking about rolling or or brushing, but there's an opportunity to spray a door as well. Sure. Uh, but I would recommend... You, I feel like only if you get it out. Yeah. No, I agree. The uh, But I would recommend an HVLP sprayer. Uh, that would be a high volume, low pressure sprayer. You're going to get um, not a ton of overspray there in it. They make some really nice homeowner grade DIY HVLP sprayers. Uh, I'm looking at buying one. Yeah. I don't own one yet, but I would really like to have one. I've painted several pieces of furniture and I did use on my last one. I painted it out in the lawn and I used my home painter that I have. And that uh, I got white paint everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely everywhere. Yeah. So then the next one I did after that. You flocked your front lawn? <laughs> yeah, essentially. <laughs> uh, but the next one I did after that, I used a slow drying enamel specifically for painting furniture. And that stuff laid out so nicely. I put several coats on there, even with brush. I brushed on some areas that you had to get into. There's some fine detail on a piece of uh, furniture that we bought for my daughter. And it laid out perfectly flat. You couldn't see any of those brush marks. Here's another great tip. As long as you're in the entryway and you're painting or replacing your front door, you know what? Let's make it super easy to see. And let's replace some of those light fixtures on your front porch. That's a great idea. And, it, and maybe you only have one and maybe it's old and tired. Well, think about the possibility of adding a second light. Uh, this is something that you did on your garage, actually. You're right. You had one light on one side of your garage and uh, you decided you really wanted to even it out and put a light on either side so you went out and you bought two new lights um, you put a light block on there and you installed the lights on top of the light blocks equally from both sides same height it really changed the look of your home from from the street yeah and it wasn't terribly difficult i ran the wire that was already coming from the switch to that uh light and i just ran it up and then across the garage door over the top through the studs and then back down the other side it was super duper easy i mean if you have at a front entry what i had my situation was i have a vaulted ceiling in my entryway and i had a single cheesy black you know jelly light yeah you know, those jelly jar lights yeah outside and it was just one light so between that one single teeny light that was supposed to light up my big front porch yeah and then the one light on my garage, I mean, my my house was dark. So I went out, I took that out. I went up into the attic where that was the light wire came down through. I was able to locate that. I pulled it up through. I put a junction box there. And then I ran new wires into the soffit that I installed up there. So now I have three down shooting can lights instead of that one and it looks really really nice yeah and, and i even put them on dimmers and in addition to adding those two lights one on either side of your garage you also put in a security light right in the center of mm -hmm. your gable end up high now that's not for looks that's for function for security and when that baby's on boy you know it's on <laughs> it's super bright that lights up your whole driveway in the front of your house part of the street and a little bit of the neighbor's house but um that that's just an example of what you can do to really change the the look of the house. And you didn't go with super simple, cheap, small lights for the side of the house. You you went with some nice, tall looking lights. They don't have to be expensive just because they're big, um, but something that makes a statement. And uh, you've got a big house, so big lights that you chose look really good on there. I, I just think that that was a really good choice and a great example of what we're talking about. I'll here. throw out a pro tip, a little. A little sneaky pro tip nice. that I don't share with everybody. All right. Because it's my personal go-to. <laughs> you don't share with everybody, but we're going to share with about 100,000 100, people. I know. Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> Lamps Plus Open Box. Oh, Lamps yeah. Plus is a, uh, is a store that just all, it's all they sell is lamps in out, outdoor fixtures, indoor fixtures. But they have a site called Lamps Plus Open Box, and they have the most amazing deals 
on lights. And typically you can only get one or two, sometimes three lights because they're, you know, either at the end of their run or just an open box. So there you go. That's a really good idea. And maybe Habitat for Humanity Restore. Just throwing that out there. We got to take another quick break. When we come back, more Curb Appeal. You're listening to Tony Corey, your week in works. around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Now, here's Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for staying with us. Today we're recording, we're on YouTube, and uh, go check us out. YouTube.com forward slash WW Home Show. You can watch all of our shows on there. Uh, we're also on Instagram and Facebook at WW Home Show. We're also on Pinterest. We got all kinds of cool stuff going on yeah, out absolutely, there. Absolutely, yeah. I go to our it. website. It's uh, www.homeshow.com. Or you can go to par.com, click on the Weekend Warriors link, and uh, we'll, all your questions, comments, stuff like that, you can leave there, and uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Today we're talking about curb appeal. Curb appeal. Yes. Is your curb appealing? It is very appealing, in my opinion. (laughs) You know, which leads me to a quick tip. I'll give you a tip on your curb appeal. You live in a house long enough, you forget what it looks like from different angles because you only look at it from the same angle every time, either from the driveway or as you're getting out of your car, as you walk up. Take a second, walk across the street. And look at your house from different angles. It'll give you a different perspective in which you can say, man, I should, I should fix that up. That's looking pretty shabby. Or, man, I should, I should plant some flowers right there or something. You should probably go across the street to the neighbor's house and look at your house from his armchair. Because <laughs> whatever it is that he's seeing uh, on all the hours that he spends in his in his family room is probably the one thing you need to work on. I would ask permission first. Yeah, you definitely. Yeah. Don't invite yourself in. Uh, but that makes a, that's a really good point. Here's another tip to go right along with that. If you're wondering how other people view your home, well, ask them, have a friend, uh, or a coworker or something, uh, come over and, and walk around the house and take a look at what they see. Uh, we give that tip also, if you're considering how secure your home is, whether or not you have, um, if you have weaknesses in your home security, then uh, you can have somebody, an anonymous party, come over um, and Pay take them 50 and, bucks. Yeah, and just say, let's, let's, have, let's have dinner, walk around the house, take a look, see what you see. If you were going to break in this house, where would you start and how <laughs> would you go about it? Yeah, that's not a bad tip. I know we've given that out before. Yeah. It does seem weird, right? You invite your friend over to say, hey, If you were going to break in my house. Let's figure out how to rob my house. See, if my friend asked me that, I'd be like, why would you ask me? Yeah. (laughs) Why why (laughs) Why me? Why why would you think I could easily break into your house? (laughs) Yeah. Sensitive. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, but it's a good idea. See it from somebody else's eyes. That might give you a fresh perspective and some new ideas and uh, some inspiration to get some things accomplished. Yeah. So let's get back into it. We've been talking about the entry. The entry way is... You know, it's the, the very first thing people see when they walk up to your house. Their eyes are drawn to it. To the front entryway. We mm-hmm. talked about replacing the hardware, replacing your lighting, even painting the door or replacing the door. Maybe adding some glass if there's not some yes. in your door. Yeah. The uh, But there's some other really cheap and easy things you can do, like putting flowers in yes. or putting some, you know, uh, potted plants or... A seating area on your front porch. If you've got room, you know, I have a pretty large front porch on my, on my home. It's probably 10 by 20. It's big. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe 12 by 20. It's pretty large. And it was blank. There's nothing up there. So we bought a couple chairs and a little table, you know, and a rug, a couple potted plants. It just looks really nice. It is nice. Inviting. And And it's covered. Not everybody has the opportunity. Not everybody has a covered front porch. Um, but if you have a covered front porch, it gives you an opportunity to put some things out there that aren't just going to see the weather. They can be left out there 
Um, but if, if you're concerned about that, just buy some all weather furniture that you can put there that you don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting getting a little bit of little dampness or whatever. And then be careful not to leave it out through the winter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good tip. Um, here's something, a tip that I actually have run into several times in my front porch entry. We bought these potted plants that don't like sunlight. <laughs> they don't like direct afternoon sun. Well, we thought that the area that we put this potted plant, it was a hanging potted plant, that it wouldn't see that. But guess what? It does. And we burned that thing to a crisp. Mm -hmm. We had to nurse it back to life. We had to water it and water it and put it in the shade. And it came back. But we had to pay attention to where that sunlight hits at certain times of the day. Because when we got home from work, it was already passed. But from the hottest times of the day, it was right overhead, and it was burning that, that plant up. So You realize that would have been a better spot for a cactus? <laughs> well, maybe not a cactus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that you don't think about, but pay attention when you're buying plants. I'm sure plant people will say this. They'll say, duh. Yeah. But I didn't know that, you know. I just assumed, hey, the shady spot, oh, it's shady here. We'll put it here. So here's a really great quick tip or another idea for something you can do in the intro with. It is not expensive. It simply is not expensive, but you know what? It goes a long ways. A no soliciting sign. Oh, that is <laughs> the, there. Are, I am not going to comment on that. You say uh, cookies only. <laughs> uh, put a welcome mat there. Even if everybody's not welcome, put a welcome mat there anyways. Um, welcome mats. And it doesn't have to say welcome. It can say whatever. We could say we love dogs. Put something there that uh, gives people an opportunity to wipe their feet, brush their feet before they go in. Something that matches, something that looks inviting, something that uh, it dresses up the entryway. And if you have one there already, make sure that you keep it clean. It does serve a purpose. It removes debris from the bottom of shoes. Even if you haven't just been walking through mud, there's still debris on your shoes. Give uh, give yourself or everybody that comes to your house an opportunity to clean off the bottom of their shoes. And if it's full of stuff, then it's not doing the job it could be doing if it were clean. So if you don't have a welcome mat, add one. Yeah, and if a good you tip. do, clean it. It's a good tip. You know, in my front entry, again, it's, it's really big and deep. And I get a lot of leaves and needles, like pine needles, that just blow in there. And they collect and every time I mow the lawn and I blow off my driveway and my sidewalks, I have to go up there and blow that area out because I always have a stash of leaves yeah. crept up under the by the doormat. Yeah. Pretty soon you're going to go to blow that and you're going to find critters in there making homes or something. Nesting on my doormat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's something. Here's another one. This We've been talking about mostly smaller projects. Here's a, a project that's a little bit on the larger side, and I kind of alluded to it a moment ago. If you've got a front porch that is not covered consider building a porch cover whatever that is whether that's a six foot by six foot patio or or a deck or whatever it is consider putting a porch cover on there that's a great idea it is a sort of big project and you're definitely spending some more money but i'll tell you right now a, a patio cover on the front of your house is uh, an absolutely great way to improve the value over your home to get your uh, investment, your return on that investment, and really make the front of the home look super great and inviting. And it's a great usable space. Well, you know, at your house, you want to keep those Girl Scouts dry. That's right. When they come and knock and then it's raining. Because I buy a lot of cookies. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we've got a whole another list of stuff for you folks, so don't go away. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Tony Corey, Your Weekend Warriors, and we're going to be right back. Tony and Corey, your Weekend Warriors, with a great quick tip for you. Corey and I are here building this uh, mobile collapsible workbench, and we were just cutting two by four, inch and a half thick, with his circular saw. Most circular saws come with an adjustable depth cut, and you need to have an inch and a half or two inches to cut through two by four, but we're moving now to three quarters of an inch plywood, and we wanna shallow up the depth of that cut so that that blade is not hanging out there when we're cutting something, potentially interacting with something that's underneath the surface that we're working with. It can be dangerous, and this is a safety measure that you should use every opportunity you get. 
Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll catch you next time. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Today we're talking about curb appeal and uh, the effects that it makes on the value of your home. As with any project, I mean, your ultimate goal is to either maintain or grow the value of your home. Too many people, right? too many people curb their appeal. <laughs> and you got to stop curbing that appeal. Cur- curbing the curb appeal project? Yeah, they're curbing the appeal. So uh, we've been kind of focusing on the entryway because it's very, very important. Indeed. Uh, But here, you know, here's one, Tony. You talked about cost versus value. Uh, Your garage door. Yes. The big, huge garage door. Overhead door. That's on the majority of the people's homes are in the front. You know, I actually really like it when they put the garage door on the side. You don't see that too often. Mm -hmm. But... That big garage door, if that thing's old, wooden, dented, painted, it's all coming off, peeling off, or, yeah, or if it's aluminum or steel and it's all dented up, rusty, a new garage door is not that expensive. I mean, you could get a new one put on, I think I paid 1500 bucks. I think. I got an all brand new fiberglass insulated garage door with windows across the top. Yeah, it's nice. The old one that I had was wood and it was just solid. Yeah. And it was pitch black in my garage. I hated it. When the garage went door went down, pitch black. Yeah. So now I got those nice lights in there and it looks really, really nice from the street. Yeah, I agree. It, that's huge. It looks really, really good. Uh, it, it's not a bank breaker. Uh, it is, there is a bit of an investment there, but it's not a bank breaker. Um, not typically a project that I think your everyday weekend warrior would undertake. I don't think any, no, absolutely not. Uh, definitely something, not you, something, would pay, you, would something you would pay an yeah. overhead door company to come and do. The, but s- the springs on a garage door are not to be messed with. Not to be trifled with. Trifled. Do not trifle with it. You will get wrecked. Yes, uh, replacing your garage door is a great, great idea. It doesn't have to break the bank, but it does really improve. Here's another thing. As long as you're I doing that, too. as long as you're doing that, it's an opportunity for you to add or replace your garage door opener. If you don't have one, you'll never have any idea how amazing it is to have it until you have it. So and let then me, once let me you have say, it, you will never want to be without it. I paid 1500 bucks for my brand new garage door with the garage door opener. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, a garage door expensive. opener, honestly, is 250 bucks. The garage door opener is something you can install. If you have a garage door that operates properly, a garage door opener is something that you can install. As a matter of fact, I have a new garage door opener in a box in my garage that needs a couple of weekend warriors to come over and install. <laughs> what are you saying? Uh, I'm saying that maybe that's our next project. Right. We'll see. It's something that you can, that can be done, definitely within our capability. And uh, if we could inspire a few people to get a garage door opener, I, I really think that they improve the resale value of that your home. Seems like a pretty heavy project. For such a small thing. But I'm in. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that for sure. Here's another one. Mm-hmm. Something that takes up a lot of square footage on the front of your home that you don't really think about a lot are your gutters. Oh, yeah. Take a look at your gutters. Are they really beat down, rusty, falling off? I mean, you can get all new gutters installed on your entire home and they're not that expensive. They come out with a seamless gutter. A lot of times it'll be on the back of a truck or a trailer and they'll roll up and they bend your gutter right in place. They roll up with a big gigantic coil yeah. and they just come out. Bang, bang, bang. Put them up. Continuous look, gutter. They just look fantastic. That's, new gutters. Yeah, that's, that's if they're beat up. I mean, a lot of times people look at their gutters and think, oh, those are terrible. And really they just need to be washed probably. And sometimes the the gutter spikes need to be replaced with new gutter spikes. And sometimes the gutter spikes need to be replaced with gutter screws. Uh, if your gutters are coming away from your truss tails and the nails or the gutter spikes you've got in there are just not holding it together anymore, you can replace those nails with screws and get those gutters sucked right back up tight to those truss tails. And if they're clean and attached properly, it might look better than you think. Yeah, we need to do a video about that. Absolutely. Another project we could do at my house. I definitely have some gutter spike issues. Do you? Yeah, I do. I All really right. do. <laughs> Sounds like we're going to Tony's house. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, back to back to the front of the house. 
trim around the windows and doors. Trim around the windows and doors, oftentimes the paint will start to peel there uh, before it's peeling off of your siding. A lot of times siding is a is a pre-finished type of something that was primed ahead of time. And or a lot fiber of, cement. Or fiber cement. With wood trim. And a lot of times the paint on that siding is... Um, lasts a lot longer, looks better longer. And the trim a lot of times is the first thing on the house to show signs of wear. Take a look at the trim around your windows and doors. Is it rotting or is it checking, splitting or cracking? Is the caulking around it failing? Or is it just really in need of a new coat of paint? Um, that's a very big one. I think the, the trim around the windows and doors is huge. Definitely take a look at that because if the caulking is failing or the trim is split or cracked, if water is getting in there, you can have a problem a lot bigger than just a fresh coat of paint. Yeah. Checking the caulking around your doors and windows, what you're looking for is gaps. That's really it. You're looking to see if the caulking in there is dried and shrunk up and not filling that gap, not filling that void. Um, if it was built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, then chances are it's, and it hasn't been replaced, it's probably failing. Yeah. You know, the old technology in caulking, you know, the polyurethanes, the Volcoms. Even as recently as 2005. Yeah. I mean, they they don't last or they didn't last. They didn't have those elastomeric qualities as some of the very new technology that they come out that those things expand and contract a lot. A ton. Ten times more. And they last quite a bit longer. But even now, with the newest technologies, I mean, you're supposed to replace your caulking like every five years. Eh, I think or it's every a little ten, more. Maybe. Yeah, every ten years. Mm -hmm. So it's something to look at. If, if the caulking is bad, you will have problems. Yep, absolutely. That's definitely something to take a look at. And it will definitely improve the curb appeal of your home. A fresh coat of paint on that trim. Here's a cheap, cheap and easy curb appeal thing. Put a bird feeder in. Yeah. A bird feeder is so cool looking. And depending on which ones you have, I mean, you could bring a lot of wildlife. And that curb appeal of just having the wildlife there or, you know, hummingbirds. I love seeing hummingbirds. I do, too. In the yard. Mm. Uh, here's a little here's a little side note. If you're going to add a bird feeder and you decide you want to have a big bird feeder because you think the bigger the bird feeder, the more the birds I'm going to get. And then you put that bird feeder out there and you dump a whole bunch of bird feed on it. What's it turn into? Well, you know, there's a possibility as that bird feed falls from the bird feeder. Because birds get in there and they slosh around and bird feed goes flying. I've noticed that birds pick out the stuff they want. And the other stuff just goes flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes birds will shuck it and just leave the, you know, the shell behind. But um, as, bird, as bird feed falls from that bird feeder, uh, that becomes food for another kind of animal. You can inadvertently draw rodents like mice or rats uh, to your bird definitely squirrels to your bird feeder area, and um, that might not be something you're looking to do. So be be wary of that. Um, maybe use the bird feed in moderation in a smaller little thing there where maybe it's not as likely to fly out and become a pile on the ground. Yeah, or at least clean up the mess. Or that. Yeah. Every so often. Good thought. Uh, here's another super simple, I'm back on the entryway, love the entryway, super simple, easy, inexpensive. Change your house numbers. Change the house numbers on the house. Make sure that they're big and bold and easy to see and not some, you know, 1970s cursive weirdness, right? Well, you know, the thing about it too that I always like to say is to make sure that you match the aesthetics of your home. I mean, if you have a very traditional home, getting super modern numbers probably wouldn't look very good. You know, for if you have a super mid-century modern home, those old traditional numbers probably would look also terrible. So that's my always thing is match the aesthetics of the home you're living in. Make sure they're not small and don't try to hide them. Um, put them out where they're wide in the open so everybody can see them. They are functional. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, more Curb Appeal. You're listening to Tony Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Car Lumber is committed to providing the best customer service. We provide personal service. We're problem solvers. We're positive and courteous. We're competent and professional. We are committed to delivering exceptional service every time. 
We're appreciative and we care. We are Par Lumber. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. If you haven't already, go check out our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. Even Pinterest, we're at WW Home Show. Or you can search Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. We'll come right up. And uh, we'll have all of our videos on YouTube of this show. We're recording that right now. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, today we're talking about curb appeal. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the entryway. There's a couple more things, you know, in the entryway that really make a big impact. You know, if your entryway is wood, you can reseal it, sand it, reseal it, or you can paint it. Uh, if it's old rotted wood, maybe consider putting treks down there. Yeah, that's a good I idea. Mean, there's a lot of different things you can do there. Your entryway is Ipe, right? That's right. With tiger wood, technically. But yes, it's definitely a Brazilian hardwood. Uh, it's one by four Brazilian hardwood, which uh, I absolutely love, blind fastened. And uh, it's 12 years old. So it's definitely showing its age. Uh, and um, and I, I have to stain it every, I mean, I, I really should be staining it every year, but I stain it about every two years. It's a covered porch, all covered, full wrap. And so I don't get as much damage to it by the sun, uh, just in a couple areas where the sun hits it more. But um, yeah, mine is definitely in need of being cleaned and restained. And I use Penifin on mine. Penifin is a is a penetrating oil stain, so it doesn't leave any solid solids on the surface of the wood or deck that can later peel off. It's uh, you just put the oil on, it soaks in, it protects the wood from the inside out, and then when the time comes to reapply, you can just reapply right over top. Nice. So yeah, the, I do. It's wood. And honestly, I've given a lot of thought to taking it up and replacing it with something that's newer and fresher. But that Brazilian hardwood really has an old, you know, sort of rustic amazingness to it. When you put a new fresh coat of stain on it, it revitalizes it. Man, it's hard to beat. It's a really good looking deck. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. It's definitely something you don't want it to neglect. Right. Being a huge part of your front entryway. And with the ability now to, re to go composite decking like Trex with their basics line that is price competitive with almost any wood out there at $1.75 a foot. That is definitely a product that uh, gives you an opportunity to have a very low maintenance deck surface yeah. um, and in lieu of wood. Here's a different one for the front of your home. From the curb, consider putting on shutters. Oh, yeah. Or if you have shutters, maybe put a fresh coat of paint on them. Yeah. We had shutters on our front of our house. Uh, we had our home painted last year, and uh, I didn't like the shutters particularly. So I said, let's take them off. And my wife disagreed, and she said, no, let's get them painted. Let's choose a new color, something that matches the new paint color. And we painted them, and now I love them. Yeah. They look really, really nice on the front of the house. Yeah. So that's something that makes a pretty dramatic look uh, change to the front of your home. And something, if you are if you feel like the shutters that are on the front of your home, if you have them, are tired, there's an opportunity to change. If you've got louvered shutters, you can change to a panel shutter. Or, or vice versa, if you have panel shutters, change to a louvered shutter. It's really a different look. And when you get a fresh coat of paint on and some maybe a different style of shutter that's there, you may realize that you really do still like them. Yeah. So this one's kind of obvious, right? Trim all of the bushes and shrubs that are overgrown around your house. Yeah. I mean, that is the easiest, cheapest, freest thing you can do. You know, I always say nothing touches your house. Right. If it's touching your house, it needs to be trimmed back at least 16 to 18 inches. I think they recommend more like two to three feet. Because all you're doing is inviting in moisture, bugs, you know, rodents. It's, it's just a highway for them to get into your home. And if your house has wood siding, uh, all of that moisture that's in a tree or in a bush or in a shrub is soaking into your home through the paint. And uh, you definitely want to keep those trimmed back. Not to mention, in some cases, those 
those organics can grow into the house and they can grow underneath the siding and cause it to fail. You know, ivy, for example, people think, boy, ivy growing on my house would be absolutely gorgeous. Well, I agree. I think ivy growing on a house is gorgeous. If it's a brick house or a stucco house or something that's not a wood that's going to ultimately suffer from that. So be careful about infiltration too of those plants they can grow right in and really damage the structure of the home yeah i had a wisteria at my old home that would grow up the front entry we had this uh, kind of old style 70s metal scrolled metal post at the corner mm -hmm. and we had a wisteria at the bottom of that it would grow up and that thing would grow into my gutter over top of the gutter and then it would start crawling up under the roof deck yikes so i had to get in there regularly and trim that thing back but you really couldn't tell. Yeah. So something to keep in mind. Uh, you're just inviting problems. Yeah, absolutely. I have another quick one, too. Sure. For the front of your home, you know, kind of sticking with the landscaping. Obviously, a fresh mowed grass, mm. keeping it tight. Pull those weeds. Pull the weeds. Um, but I, I always like to change the direction when I mow. It keeps your grass from laying down in weird angles. Uh, grass tends to grow, if you mow it the same every time, uh, you'll get weird lines in there where the grass kind of grows differently. Interesting. So you should always alternate. So change the direction at which you're mowing, you know, every other mow. Interesting. So I'll mow straight, and then I'll mow at this angle, and then I'll switch and mow the other angle. And it keeps the lawn looking really nice. Huh. That's a great tip. I, uh, I did not know that. I see that people mow at angles and different angles, but I, I didn't really know why. So uh, that's great. I love yep. that. Uh, here's one. This is very obvious. We actually alluded to it really early in the show. How about your mailbox? How does your mailbox look? If your mailbox is in disrepair or it's just old or maybe it's not working properly, you know, it needs a fresh look. A lot of people take this real serious and they'll build a mailbox from scratch that sort of em resembles their home, emulates, yeah, their home, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I guess you could overdo it, maybe, but um, getting a little bit uh, uh, creative with your mailbox, I think, is a great way to go. Uh, but a good looking mailbox uh, is a good representation of a home that cares how their home looks from like one the of those curb. big fish mouths where the <laughs> mouth is the. The yeah. door. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a mailbox. Um, I saw a mailbox that looked like a big giant pipe that you would see come off a of Popeye's boat. Right, it comes up and then turns over, <laughs> and the mailbox was right in the end of that big, uh, like nautical boat pipe. It was pretty weird, actually. <laughs> I expected to see olive oil in there or something. That's pretty funny. You know, here's another one for the front of your home: landscape lighting. Not only do you have to worry about curb appeal during the day, but at night, you know, if your house is really dark uh, all the way around, consider putting in some solar landscape lighting or regular, you know, wired low voltage landscape lighting. That's actually on my to-do list this year. I have all of the lights. I have the controller. I have all the wire. I just need to find a free weekend and another weekend warrior to help me. Yeah. Uh, but we can get that done because nothing to me looks better than having a well-lit front yard. I agree with that completely. Uh, my solution for that, when, when I was in the exact same need, I actually put a lamp post. I put a lamp post at the farthest front corner of my front lawn, and I put a photo cell on it. And so that thing comes on when it gets dark and turns off when it gets light, and uh, it's got three little bulbs on it. Very cool looking, um, just like something you'd see on Bourbon Street in uh, New Orleans or something, but nice. it's a very cool light. It's a great addition to my yard, and I love it. Hey, we've got to jump to a break here in just a minute, but when we come back, we are going to tantalize your imagination with some of the tall tales, maybe, or stories that we've heard from contractors or homeowners that have had some real pains in the house uh, as homeowners. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. You're listening to Tony and Corey. Your Weekend Warriors. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Today in the show, we're talking about 
Curb appeal. Curb appeal. But we wanted to take a quick second and bring back an old segment that we used to call pain in the house. Yes. And uh, it's where we would go out and find horrible stories of people that uh, unthinkable things happened inside of their homes. Think people just like you and me doing the thing. That's right. And, and having just the very worst luck befall them. Well, and you know, this story actually started with you, Tony. Uh, this segment, I should say, when you dropped that screwdriver on that can of black spray paint <laughs> and ruined oh, yeah. the carpet, the floor, and your front entry door. Oh, yeah. Running it. Disaster. Out to the front. Disaster. Absolute disaster. It's a, it's uh, When I think back on that, it, it makes me tired. It was, uh, it was so <laughs> terrible. Such a terrible, terrible thing terrible. to have happen. And it, and, it, you know, it costs money, too. And so anyway, yeah. So I scoured the internet and I found uh, this website called Reddit. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, there's, uh, I subscribe to one of the subreddits on there where s people ask the question, what's the worst thing that ever happened in your home? Uh, yeah. So I stumbled upon this and I've picked out a few good stories of uh, Redditors that uh, had some serious disasters happen to them. Yes, home so, improvement gone wrong. So let's share them. Yeah. All right. So this is from our first Redditor. First day in first house. Had to remove the sliding glass door to get some furniture in. We wanted to flip it anyways for better flow. So I figured why not do it now? Everything went well with the door panel swap. So we took a break and I ordered pizza for our moving friends. While waiting for the pizza, I decided to reinstall the hardware. The last of which was just drilling two holes and screwing down the floor lock. On the second hole, the drill bit nicked the edge of the glass, Ooh. and the whole pane shattered and fell all over. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's terrible. Here's the thing about sliding glass doors. They're all made out of tempered glass. Yeah. So if you just slightly crack it, yeah. and they're very strong. They're strong, no doubt. But if you just, yeah, with a little drill bit like that. It would shatter the whole thing. Into seven billion pieces. That's right. What a mess that would make. Not to mention the amount of money that he's going to have to spend to replace that. Yeah, I feel bad for And that then guy. have to do it all over again. I feel bad for him, too. Probably a uh, couple hundred bucks there. And always, do you feel like the worst things happen right at the end of a project? You've almost successfully completed yeah. it. You're right there. Either it and happens, then it happens. Either it happens right in the beginning, right when you're getting started. It just hits the fan. It derails the whole project. Yeah, it just goes downhill quick. Or it's the last thing. The whole <laughs> thing just about went off without a hitch. The cherry on top. And then and it, it happens. shatters yeah. your door. Terrible. All right, here's another story. While digging a trench to my garage for electricity, as I drove my shovel into the ground, it did not stop. What? It disappeared into the ground. <laughs> I think I cussed out loud as I bent to see what had just happened. Turns out there is an 1800s well in my backyard. About eight feet in diameter and 20 feet deep. What? The well was covered with big rocks and runs under my driveway, so that was extremely nerve-wracking. I did not get my shovel back. <laughs> I can't you believe imagine? that. No. Yeah, I'd be, I'd I be mean, freaking out. On one hand, though, he's discovered a well. I mean, if it's, if it's a viable well, unless it's like just a dry well. Well, I'm sure they covered it up for a reason. But if it was a viable well, you know, maybe you... You know, it's expensive to drill a well. Very expensive. Are you going to go out there with a bucket and rope? Oh, well, maybe. 1800 maybe. style? Yeah, but <laughs> why not, right? All right, I got some more stories for you okay, here. Okay, go. All right, went up... Uh, went to put up all new custom shelves in the master closet. I went to drill a hole and heard a huge bang. Then the power went out. Ooh. I drilled right through an electrical wire. Oh, yeah. He says, that's okay. I had wire on hand from a previous project. I'll just fix it real quick. So he opened the wall, and it was a much thicker wire than he expected. Uh-oh. I realized I was out of my league, so I called an electrician only to find out I had drilled right through the electrical wire to the dryer. <laughs> oh, no. You could have died. Yeah, that could have been really bad. That's messed up. That is super scary. You know, there are uh, there are measures that people take to keep that from happening. Uh, one of them is called a nail stop. And uh, you put those in the stud, you know, to keep that from happening. Uh, but like you said, Corey, like we talked before, there's only a certain amount of distance between the sheetrock on an interior wall. And if you're driving a screw through there, 
that's longer than it needs to be and you're not hitting a stud, there is that possibility you could put it through a wire. Yeah, you got to be careful there. Uh, a couple more stories here. Here's another electrical story. Turned off the power to a switch, a light, or turned off the power to a switch so he could switch it out to a smart switch. Oh, okay. All right. Tested the switch I was removing. No power. Got the power off, went to remove the switch, and bumped into the one next to it in the same box. And he was shocked. <laughs> Electrically. Uh, Turns out, even though they were in the same box, they were on different breakers. You, you just don't know who's been there before you. There's something, a painful realization that we came to when we did a lot of the remodel work in your home. Oh, absolutely. You just don't know who's been there before you and what types of shortcuts they took. We'll tell a quick pain in the house story here. So Tony and I were doing a YouTube video. We recorded a video on replacing uh, receptacles. Yes, that's right. Brand new receptacles and switch plates and mm -hmm. covers. It was a really nice little video, and Tony was doing it by himself. He had a question about it. He said, "Hey, well, you know, what do you think here?" And I walked over there, and he had used the tester. That's our that is our recommendation. Always use an electrical tester, right, on whatever project you're working on to ensure that the electricity is certainly turned off right you touch the tester to the wire yep uh and it will light up or vibrate or something it will indicate yeah. to you beep, 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 if beep. there's power there and if it does not give you an indication then that is dead right. so however tony was using my tester not my tester. not my tester it's slightly different it has a button that you have to push and then you hold it up to the electricity that you're trying to test and it either turns on or off or or it does not so I'm downstairs at the electrical panel. Tony's upstairs. And with the I, tester. And I flip the switch, and he says, it's off. So I run upstairs. He's doing the video. He pulls it off. He asks some questions. So I walk over there, and I grab the outlet out of his hand, <laughs> only to get the crap shocked out of me. <laughs> and I was like, what in the world? He's like, oh, I tested it twice. Yeah. Only to realize that he was not pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> to turn the stinking thing on. Yeah, my uh, my electrical tester does not have a button. My electrical tester lights up or does not light up. Uh, there's no button. So I learned a valuable lesson there. Um, know your tools and use your tools. If you're going to use somebody else's tools, ask them how they work. Yeah, that one hurt. Yeah. That actually, my hand hurt. My finger hurt for about three days. Yeah. So anyway, I couldn't imagine uh, getting shocked by 220 from a dryer. No, no, I cannot. Also. All right, here's the last couple stories here. Uh, this guy says, we bought a new fridge off Craigslist so we could pre-make and freeze meals prior to baby number one coming. However, the fridge didn't fit through the doorway into our 1800s built kitchen. I'd been repairing the plaster, or I'd been doing a bunch of updates on the house already, including some drywall and gotten pretty good at repairing the plaster. In my primitive mind... Nothing was going to get in the way of me installing this fridge today. I figured I would just take an angle grinder with a sanding wheel and take a little bit of plaster from the opening since it was so close. This is a horrible mistake. <laughs> 10,000 RPMs creates a lot of dust. The entire house, full of baby toys, changing tables, rocker, wife, etc., was ex covered in 120-year-old plaster dust. <laughs> oh, man. She probably wanted to kill him. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, um, it, it's difficult enough to try to keep everything for a new baby clean in the house. <laughs> um, but adding that is uh, would have been certainly um, adding insult to injury. Oh, man. Well, so here's his second story. He had a part due uh, when his wife was pregnant with their second child. In a different home, he used a pressure washer to clear a sewage line. What? Ended up making a sewage geyser oh. <laughs> in our only bathroom until the water drained through the floor into the basement. Oh, no. My wife had to wait to pee until <laughs> I was done re-decontaminating our only bathroom, which was not quick. Oh, my goodness. That's that's that for me of all. All of these is a worst case scenario. I think he's lucky to be alive. That is uh, something that I definitely would not want to have to deal with. Sewage? A Ugh. pressurized, Ugh. wow, danger. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we've got our stories, right? Our things we've had to deal with as weekend warriors or DIYers. Um, and, you know, those are memories and lessons learned and all of that stuff. But you know what? In the worst situations that I've been in, I would not choose not to take on 
my own projects, absolutely. which I absolutely love to do. I do want to throw this out there. If you have any fantastically horrible stories of things that happened to you, email them to us. We would love, love, love to hear about them. Yep, absolutely. All right, folks, that's all the time we've got. We appreciate you so much for listening. This has been another episode of Your Weekend Warriors right here on the Weekend Warriors Radio Network. Have a great week.